And Matthew's question is, he would love to hear Mike's take on what the serif are, particularly in relation to the bronze snake incident and numbers. And Lindsay wants to know, should we imagine there being any kind of physical resemblance between real divine beings and the representative images have found throughout history? That is, do seraphim really look like snakes with wings? Well, I mean, you... <laughs> Do they really look like snakes with wings? But this this takes us into all sorts of things. There's, boy, this is one of those cases where I wish, you know, there were certain journal articles that were sort of publicly available. And I'm trying to, I'm racking my brain here. This one might actually be uh, publicly available because it's from Biblica. Uh, so if you want to Google Biblica, B-I-B-L-I-C-A, and then journal and put in the last name P-R-O, V E N C A L. Okay. Uh, I think his first name is Philip, but I, but I'm, I'm, I could be mistaken there. There's an article on the, the term Saraf, the, the Saraf terminology. And I think this is really a good article because it goes into the, the zoology uh, behind the terminology. And there's a lot of good material in this, in this journal article about how the term, the biblical term Saraf, which is often kind of assumed to, to be the verb, you know, to burn, uh, sort of th th that, that typical view kind of overlooks the fact that we also have a noun here and we have an Egyptian term, SRF, okay, for, for lack of, you know, being able to illustrate hieroglyphs here. But we have a, uh, an Egyptian term of the same consonants that means snake, okay, and specifically, you know, this idea of a winged serpent isn't actually a, a serpent with like wings like a bird. It comes from cobra imagery, where you know, as a, when you're looking at a cobra, it it can it, it the skin on the on the sides of it can become sort of flanges, you know, that that protrude from its body on either side. That is where the the ancient you know Semitic idea of the winged you know serpent comes from, because it looks like it's it's got appendages. And this this terminology again from Egypt really kind of covers. Both the burn and the, and the serpent, because you know you have certain parts of the Middle East that where you had spitting cobras, and if you were hit by the venom, it would burn, or if you're bitten, it would burn. You know, so the fiery serpents—they're not like serpents that are flames, you know, kind of, you know, flitting around in the sand. It, it's 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 metaphorical language for the the pain that it inflicts, and you have the same situation going on on here. So you have. You have seraf to burn. You have seraf, you know, serpent, and they they're kind of like two sides of the same coin. So as far as the terminology, I think that is you know the the, the right way to understand the term itself. It's not just burn. It, it it also again is serpent. And so when you go to the biblical seraphim, you know the question is: Is this actually what a seraphim looks like? Well, you know, on one level, yeah. If you're if you're Isaiah, you're in the in the throne room and you encounter, you know. If you're in the throne room of God, you encounter a, a seraphim, you know, sh well, shouldn't, shouldn't this be the way they look like? Well, the problem with that is you have, you know, a, a seraph, an SRF in, in Egypt. This particular term is also used of a divine throne guardian. You say, well, why is that a problem? Well, because the Bible not only uses that term for a divine throne guardian, but it also uses cherub, karuv, Akkadian, uh, which again, in, in Mesopotamian, you know, thinking is also a throne guardian. So you can't really have a throne guardian that looks like a, a serpent and then, you know, well, I, did it change its appearance when it looks like a, you know, a cherub, a winged, you know, kind of bovine character or something like that, you know, or a winged, you know, leonine character, depending on the, the Mesopotamian iconography. I, I don't, I don't think we can, we can look at this material and say, Hey, you know, if, if like, well, I'm walking down the road someday and I'm encountered by a seraphim. This is what they're going to look like. I don't think that's the point. I think these terms are used of divine beings whose specific role is thought to be guarding the throne of the Almighty. You say, well, why the two different orientations? Why the two different terms? Why the two different you know, iconographical appearances? Well, you would use, you're going to see cherub and this I'm going to I'm going to leave the statement at what I'm going to say here and we'll see if anybody picks on why picks up on why this would be controversial. But you're going to see karuv, the Mesopotamian term used in texts that were composed in a Mesopotamian context. 
because that is going to communicate with the immediate audience of the day. When the biblical writer uses karuv, karuvim, people are going to know instantly what that is and what its role is because they've seen that in the throne iconography of the particular location that they're in. If you use the SRF, serif, okay, in, in, in Egyptian, if you use that, well, that's a, a good indication that that text was composed in some historical context where the Egyptian iconography, the Egyptian trappings of royalty would have been seen and understood and evident. And so that is why the biblical writer uses an Egyptian term in one text and a Mesopotamian term in another. It has to do with the context in which the original readers would have been familiar at the time of the writing of the text. Now, I'm going to leave it there. And again, we'll see if, if listeners pick up on why that might be a controversial statement. And if, if it is, you can send that to Trey and we can, we can comment it on, on it in the next uh, Q&A. But I don't think any of these descriptions you know, can really be you know, used to, to sort of uh, you know, zoologically classify divine beings because divine beings by nature are not actually embodied. Now you say, well, if, if they came here to earth, you know, like could they – you know, if a throne guardian came here to Earth and they wanted a human to know it was a throne guardian, could they pick that appearance so someone familiar with their Bible would know that, hey, that's a throne guardian over there? Well, I suppose so. You know, I, I suppose that that could happen. Um, but what you typically see is is these are heavenly visions where where prophets or whoever are again transported into the divine realm, and again that that's how the the role of this particular divine being is is telegraphed to the one who views it. But by nature, they're not embodied. They don't have, you know, the, you know, the they, they don't have, you know, forms of of beings that would, or excuse me, that creatures that would correspond to a sort of the you know, terrestrial life. But when we're writing about those things, that's that helps to communicate what they do, you know, in in the spiritual world. And so that's why this this kind of this kind of language is used. So I don't know if that really helps, but again, that that's that's my perspective on it. 